Good morning. Uh, I, I work for Intel's uh, Open Source Technology Center, um, and I've been working on persistent memory for a few years now. Um, I, uh, I, I had intended to give a talk that delved into a bit more technical detail, um, but after talking with a number of delegates over the last couple of days, uh, I've realized that um, apparently some of you didn't come to the last three times I talked about persistent memory, and uh, maybe I need to spend a little bit more time explaining uh, what persistent memory is and uh, why you want to use it. But I shall go into fun, and I'm definitely going to be talking about profit. So, what is persistent memory? Well, like it says on the tin, it's memory that is persistent. It remembers what you stored into it, even when you take the power away. And uh, you know, un unlike DRAM, when you stop uh, providing DRAM with power, you lose all the data that's in your DRAM. Um, you can buy NVDIMMs today from multiple companies, and you can plug them into systems, and they work in various different ways. Um, you can buy uh, DIMMs that, for example, on power fail will copy um, all of the data that is in the DRAM that is on the DIMM to NAND that is also on the DIMM. And that happens um, without uh, any intervention from you. Uh, it's just a signal that comes across. Um, but in order to use that kind of thing, one of my colleagues likes to describe them as boutique solutions. You need a special power supply. You need, a, you need a certified power supply. You need a certified motherboard. You need to be buying a particular brand of, um, of Xeon CPU. Um, it is not a, um, it, it is, a, a, like I said, a boutique solution. It, it, it's, it's for people who are willing to put a lot of effort. And um, my employer would like to increase their profits by making it a more widely available uh, feature um, that's just part of the platform. It's something that you can rely on when you're writing your software. And uh, our hope is that you will write software in a way that uh, allows you to take full advantage of um, the persistent memory. For those who've been paying attention to this, this space, um, last year we, um, we, we, we announced at, the, uh, at IDF the, uh, that we are going to be shipping 3D crosspoint DIMMs in 2017. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the head of our data center group said we'll be selling a two-socket, six-terabyte server in 2017. So that's going to give you some idea of the kind of scale that we're talking about. Um, Keith Packard, down here at the front, is going to be giving a talk right after this one, which talks about an even larger system that uh, he, he has the privilege to be working on. And, uh, I'll, I'll, I, I shan't steal too much of his thunder, but if, you, if you're interested in this talk, you probably want to stick around for Keith's as well. Um, a, a lot of the um, focus in the press has been around, what is this 3D crosspoint technology? What is it made of? Um, how exactly does it work down, down? What are the physics of it? What kind of... And um, we're, we're, we're software people, we don't really care, but um, I can announce exclusively for the first time that 3D crosspoint technology is actually made of recycled newspaper. <laughs> we, we, we bought some old printing presses, it's, it's wonderful, we are literally printing money, it's wonderful. <clears throat> but yeah, you can't buy them yet. We, we're, we're not selling them, but you, 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 you can buy them from other companies and uh, you can buy NVDIMs from other companies. They don't have quite the same. You can't buy six terabytes worth of them, at least not without spending a, a, a quite ridiculous amount of money. But um, you, you, you can actually buy NVDIMs today if you're interested in starting to play with some of the, uh, the technology. For, for myself, um, like I say, I'm, I'm, I'm a software guy. I don't really care about the underlying technology of uh, you know, what, what are the bits made of. Um, so I do all my testing on, on DRAM. Um, I, I boot my system with some special kernel parameters that reserve a big chunk of memory, um, and uh, I, I, I have, and my kernel then pretends that it's been given this big chunk of persistent memory. Of course, when I have to turn the power off, um, it goes away. But I can hit the reset button because that that server doesn't zero its memory on um, on, on on reboot. So I can press the reset button and 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 keep my memory. It's just if I have to actually turn the physical power off, um, then, then things, uh, 
thing, things go away. So as software people, how do we go about using this stuff? There's a lot, there are, there are a lot of academics uh, publishing papers that talk about all kinds of interesting different ways that we might end up using um, persistent memory. And um, because they're academics and they're, they, they're doing research, they are not constrained by practical things like uh, 50 years of software. Um, so they talk about things like total system persistence. And what, what they mean by that is um, you turn the power off, you turn the power on, and everything goes back to where it was. And that's a delightful dream. Um, the problem with that is that the CPU cache is not persistent. So the, the, the megabytes of cache inside the CPU do go away. And depending on exactly which writes you have done that have got pushed out of the cache um, by the cache flushing algorithm that is, of course, deeply proprietary, um, the, so you're going to get some writes that you think have completed but actually haven't. And we, we, we did have a little chat with the CPU people about maybe they could be so kind as to implement some kind of guarantee about uh, which cache lines they would flush in which order, and they said no. We asked for a few other things, and they said no to those too. So we are, we are, we are not in a, a situation where we believe that we can put together a total system persistent uh, system today. Well, in the future, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, and then people talk about application level persistency. And that would be OK. So we, we, we can't have a situation where you turn the computer off, you turn the computer on, and it all just comes back up. But maybe we can have a system where you turn the computer off, you turn the computer on, it boots a new kernel, but then you can start up an application. So it's kind of like snapshotting an application. Maybe we can do that very cheaply. Again, we run into problems with, well, which stores have been flushed out of the CPU cache and which haven't. So again, we're not really looking at this as a practical solution. And then there are people who use the appearance of one new technology to justify the idea that they have been pushing for the last 20 years. Um, things like single address space operating systems, um, microkernels, nanokernels, unikernels, um, all, 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 kinds of, all kinds of fancy, all kinds of old ideas that haven't worked terribly well in the past, uh, because of this new technology, are going to make sense all of a sudden. And um, that, that's great. Again, I wish them the best. They can go off and, and try and do that. Um, I'm interested in getting a system into programmers' hands that you can use um, in 2017. Um, see the aforementioned profit part of the, um, start the talk. So how are we going to present, to, the, present this, um, the, this, this persistent memory to you as programmers? Um, we've, we, we talked about, and indeed uh, our um, Intel Labs um, smart people, went off and implemented their very own file system called uh, PMFS, the Persistent Memory File System. And they are very smart people, and they are not Linux kernel programmers. And they did not, uh, their, their file system is just not, um, it's not possible to take it into production. One, one of the ways that people use um, uh, the NVDIMs that are available today is that they prevent them, present them as very fast block devices. And then they write special purpose software, remember we're talking about boutique solutions, uh, which um, use this special block device, you know, they'll, they'll map this block device and they'll use the whole thing and maybe they'll use it as a RAID cache or they'll use it as uh, uh, an HTTP accelerator or something. Anyway, they, they, they'll, they'll, they'll just use the whole thing and they can do that kind of thing because they are the only application running on the system. Um, but th this doesn't feel very general to me. Um, so we, we have implemented a really fast block device and uh, we present the um, 
the, the memory to you that way, and you could, and the the customers who are already using the, the these boutique solutions can now switch over to a, a cheaper solution. Um, but it's 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 not great as a general purpose solution. So what we've ended up doing is making small modifications to existing file systems. And um, it's perhaps a good thing that Dave Chinner of XFS fame isn't here because he might be quibbling with my definition of small modifications. But um, I, I think they're fairly small modifications to the existing file systems and a big chunk of infrastructure um, inside the, the rest of the kernel to, um, to, to support the small modifications in the file systems. So we've, um, we've implemented this on top of um, EXT2. EXT2 already had support for this feature. It used to be called XIP for execute in place. And uh, the, 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 there were two or three problems with that. One is that um, XIP, ha there, there are lots of different things people think about when you talk about XIP. Um, people think maybe you're running the kernel directly out of uh, the persistent memory. And, and, and that's not what we're doing here. There are, there are other ways of accomplishing that. Um, but what we're working on is well, what, what, what EXT2 had implemented was um, running executables that weren't the kernel out of persistent memory. Um, and, 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 and that distinction was causing some confusion. So we, we thought we, we should probably try and change the name. And the other reason we wanted to change the name was that it, it's really not just about executing it's not about running executables out of, the, uh, out of the persistent memory. It's really about storing data in the persistent memory. It's, much, it's a, it's a read-write workload. It's very different. Um, so we, 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 change, we, we changed the name to DAX, D-A-X, DAX. Um, it stands for direct access because the X gets pronounced as double C. You know, it's, it's kind of nice. Um, and, and it seemed to be, it was an acronym that wasn't in use anywhere else in the kernel. That was nice. And it had an X in it, and X is exciting. So we, we kept the DAX name. And seriously, it took us like six months to come up with the name DAX. And, you know, the, the three hardest problems in computer science. Oh, so two, two hardest problems in the computer science, right? Naming things, uh, cache, co cache coherency, and fence post errors. And trust me, we have found all of those problems in this, in this project. So, okay, we, 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 we've got, we, we, we have um, presented to you a file which is on, um, we, 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 which is stored in persistent memory. So we now have a file, um, you can treat it like a file, you can do read and write to it, you can mmap it, aha, mmapping, okay, great. So na now, now we can actually do loads and stores directly to this persistent memory in your application. We're done. No, um, okay, so, I, I talked earlier about the problem of um, the CPU cache being very willing to evict dirty lines um, under whatever circumstances make sense to it, usually involving the CPU not locking up because it's trying to fill one cache line and can't find any, can't find any clean ones. It's a nightmare. Um, I, I have maximum respect for the guys who work on the CPU caches. They're, they're, they are insanely brilliant, in my opinion. Um, but we don't know what order cache lines are going to get flushed out of the CPU by the cache flushing algorithm. So the programmer has to say, please write this cache line back now. And then at least we know that that cache line is on its way to persistent memory. We don't know that it's got there, but we know that it's on its way out. So that's what, so um, this is a quirk of the Intel architecture. Um, for, for, for many years, we've only had the CL flush instruction, which um, takes a dirty cache line and it removes it from the CPU cache. Um, CL, uh, and, and oh, by the way, it also, it's also a serializing instruction. So if, if you, it, you, you uh, modern CPUs execute instructions out of order, well, it turns out the way that CL flush originally got implemented was as a serializing instruction. And we're concerned that if we um, relax that in any way, we might end up breaking applications. So we introduced a new opcode called clflushopt that is exactly the same as clflush, except that it's not serializing. So it's, it, it, it performs better. Um, 
then you have to put in a serializing instruction sometime later, but we'll get to that. Uh, CLWB is, is a new instruction, uh, not available in any shipping CPUs, and I can't tell you which CPUs it is going to be available in, but in the future, we will have the ability to keep that cache line in memory. So, it, so it keep, keep that cache line in the cache, or at least not purposely evicted from the cache. CLWB simply transitions, it, it sends the write out to the memory system and it keeps the cache line in cache, it transitions it to the clean state uh, from dirty. So those, those two send the, uh, send, the instruct send the data on their way. But we really need to know, and as, as software people, that the, uh, the write actually made it all the way to the persistent domain. And that's what the pcommit instruction is for. Uh, the P is for persistent, so it's persistent commit. And when the, when, when the persistent commit instruction returns, you know that everything that happened before the preceding store fence is now persistent. It may or may not be on media, but the, the, the system is guaranteeing to you, the programmer, that um, if power goes out at any time after the P commit returns, everything before that has been flushed out. Other things may have as well, but you're, you're guaranteed that at least these things are. So given these new CPU instructions, some people say, aha, what we need to take advantage of these is a new special purpose programming language. Some people are frustrated language designers. Other people are frustrated file system designers. I. You know, I, I have sympathy for them. It, it, it must be quite hard to believe that you, that you can be the next uh, James Gosling or, or uh, Kernighan or, or whatever. Um, but we believe that people are going to keep programming in the languages that they're accustomed to, thank you very much, and this isn't going to be sufficient reason for them to change. But, you know, th these people, we, we can't stop them from going off and developing their own special purpose programming language, but we don't have to provide them any help, and we're not. Um, so if you're writing managed code, by which I mean Perl, Python, Ruby, Java, um, Lua, um, any, any interpreted um, or, or virtual machine emulated code, um, then all we have to do, all we have to do is convert the interpreter slash uh, runtime um, to emit the uh, the p commit instructions um, and and uh, CLWB instructions at the right time. Um, so that's that, that that that's not going to require the vast majority of people in this room to change their code in any way because things are going to be magically better for them. Uh, that, that's, that's why you write managed code, right? You, you, you take the performance hit, although there's questions these days about whether it is such a huge performance hit, but you, you, you take the performance hit of not writing in C in return for so many other benefits um, that uh, you can end up with faster code anyway. But for those dinosaurs like myself who uh, continue to want to program in C, uh, we, ha we are developing um, a non-volatile memory library and we're developing this in public. Um, I've got a URL on, at, at the end of these slides that shows you um, exactly um, how long, uh, uh, that the, the, the will take you to the GitHub repo and uh, you, you can join in, the you can watch or join in the development um, as much as you uh, are inclined to. So the, NV the NVML, the non-volatile memory library, is composed of actually six different libraries. At the bottom, we have libpmem, and libpmem handles all of the um, boring bits of how the kernel actually works in terms of doing things like mmap and so on. You don't want to be calling mmap yourself. You, you, you want a, a, a fairly thin abstraction layer on top of it. And it gives you things like, OK, uh, commit this. So you don't have to hand code some assembly to do pcommit in, in your application. You, you, you call a function and under the covers. Uh, the NVML does a p commit. Um, I should say, actually, NV NVML doesn't just work on persistent memory. You can also make it work on uh, SSDs or even spinning Rust. Although I, I, I the, when you're doing 300 instruction um, IOPS per second, you know it, it, it's uh, it's not going to perform very well. 
But on top of libpmem, we, we, we have these other five libraries. Um, starting from, from the bottom, actually, because it's the easiest one, is uh, libvm malloc. We, so we, 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 we intercept malloc. And instead of um, allocating from uh, the, the, the normal way that uh, glibc um, would implement malloc, we um, instead allocate you memory from this pool of uh, persistent memory. You're thinking, well, this, this, this is daft. We have this persistent memory. Why, why, why are we treating it as volatile? Well, there's a performance cost in issuing these CLWBs and P commits, and maybe you don't want to pay that cost. And uh, as I was saying, you know, six terabytes of memory, that's, that, that's, that's kind of interesting. And uh, if, if the, uh, the performance of it is somewhat close to DRAM, then this is going to be... Um, pretty exciting for some applications, um, I th I th I th even, if it's, even if it's volatile, or perhaps especially if it's volatile. Uh, we do have applications that really want them to all go away, when, uh, go want it all to go away when, when they reboot. And you do that using your Unix, usual us Unix uh, semantics. You create the file, you open the file, you unlink the file, and then at reboot, the, the, file, sy the, the file system checks us, oh, this, this file's actually not linked into the file system anymore. I'll just delete it, and it goes away. So that's brilliant. So libvm malloc is a transpa transparent, relation, transparent replacement of malloc. libvmem is a more explicit use of persistent memory in a volatile way. So you would need to actually convert your application to use libvmem. And that's going to give you slightly better performance than using the, the wrapped libvm malloc. And um, it, it would be up to you, the programmer, to decide whether that additional performance is worth it to you. So you might want to um, check out the different APIs in use and see which one really fits your application better. So we're, we're, we're trying to give you the choice. You, we, you know, easy or slightly better performing. That's up to you. We, we don't judge. Um, so some, some other idioms that we have found people want to use um, uh, on, on top of persistent memory for is um, they, some, some people want an array of atomic blocks, and that's provided by libpmem block. So it's kind of like a slab allocator, if, if people are familiar with that uh, term for memory allocation. Basically, you, 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 you say, I, from, from this pool of memory, I want to allocate blocks that are 97 bytes long because I have a huge number of data structures that are exactly 97 bytes long, and I don't really care how you give me 97 bytes. I just want to be able to say, give me another block, give me another block, give me another block. Oh, I'll free that block. I'll free this block. So it, it's, it's using... It, you, you, you can allocate and free them in completely arbitrary ways, but, you, but everything you get from it is 97 bytes in size. Um, and then we have pmem log, and this, this is a slightly different specialization. The, this, this is saying, okay, I only want to, I, I, want, I want to have a log in my persistent memory. And you, you can see how this would be interesting to an awful lot of people. Um, I want to be able to append arbitrary amounts to the end of the array. So I'm going to say, create a, create a, new, uh, so create a new log entry, create a new log entry, create a new log entry, and they all go at the end of the log. And, and you can go back and look elsewhere in the log. You can, you, you've got arbitrary random access to somewhere else in the log, but uh, arbitrary read access, but writes always append. And there's, again, there's a fairly, significantly, a fairly significant number of applications which want to use persistent memory in that way. Um, and then we come to libpmemobj. And libpmemobj is really, to me, the interesting one. This, this, this gives you a transactional memory object store. Um, so you can, it, it provides all kinds of fun stuff on top of the, uh, the, 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 the bottom uh, libpmem library. So it has locking. So if, if, you, um, if, you, if you take a lock you can, uh, and, and a reboot happens while you've got the lock, you can come back up and do recovery and find out you know, what, what, what's, what state are we in and, and, and do we still have the lock or have we dropped it again. It's, it's really kind of cool. Um, you can allocate different kinds of objects from it. So it has uh, some type safety functions in it that let you, um, that, that, that prevent you from allocating um, 
something that represents a pen and something that represents a cat and allocate and, and then assigning the, the pen to the cat and it says, what? Well, no, you can't do that. Um, it gives you a doubly linked list, so you, you know, fairly fundamental data structure, kind of an interest, quite, kind of a, a useful one. But the, the doubly linked list, it's persistent memory safe. So if you crash in the middle of adding uh, an element to a doubly linked list, when you come back up, either the, the object was successfully added to the list, or the memory that we, you were using to, to store the object has been, uh, well, actually, it gets freed afterwards. But to your, from your application's point of view, it's as if the object you were trying to add to the list has just gone away. The, the list doesn't get corrupted underneath this, uh, this load. Um, we, we offer support for um, key value stores on, on top of uh, the transactional memory. We do replication, which is fun. Uh, you, you can replicate from one file to another file. Um, so one, one, one of the things that our customers tell us is this persistent memory stuff is all well and good, but it seems to us, the customer, that you are creating a single point of failure. And what we customers are used to is having our storage area network and our objects are over there on, on, on this part of the SAN and they're also simultaneously over there on that part of the SAN. And by the way, that part of the SAN is, is in Sydney and this part of the SAN is in Perth. And we, we, we want to keep those kinds of um, scenario, you know, that kind of disaster recovery um, scenario working. And so what replication allows us to do is uh, create, is have we would have two file systems with a uh, store on each, um, with, with, uh, sorry. Two, two, two file systems, file on each, same size, and writes to one and mirrored over to the other. And of course, the, the two files are just files as far as user space is concerned. So one of those files will be in your persistent memory of your local machine, and the other will be over in Perth. I don't know how good performance is going to be for that kind of thing, but you know, uh, some, sometimes performance is not your uh, primary motivation. We're also, uh, we also have C++ support. Um, that, that, that's uh, fairly new. That was added in the last couple of months. Um, so the, uh, the, the type safety that we have um, is, is really C-based type safety. It's, it's, it's quite um, obvious and noticeable. There, there is, it's done with macros, and, and you, you, you will see, if you go and look at the NVML, exactly how it's done. But it, it's not necessarily the... Um, it, it, it's, it's not transparent at all, in fact. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any attempt to be transparent. Whereas the C++ support is trying to be a little bit more transparent, trying to conform to the C++ idioms that C++ programmers expect. Um, and I'm not a C++ programmer, so I don't want to talk about that anymore. Um, so we've built a number of examples on top of the NVML. Um, and the, these are all part of the NVML Git tree. If you go off and download it, you can find all of these things. We also have a blog um, on the website that I'll show you at the end, pmem.io, uh, where we talk about uh, at least some of these things. So. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we, we, we have a red black tree, a B tree, and a crit bit. I'd, I'd never heard of crit bit before. So I'm, I'm, I'm learning new things about data structures just by uh, writing this talk. It was great. Uh, we have a hash map, which isn't quite the same as the doubly linked list. It's a singly linked list, just so we're not uh, burning up quite so much memory. Although with six terabytes, maybe we don't care too much. But then, you know, if you can reduce your object overhead by 5%, that does give you 5% of six terabytes is kind of a significant amount of memory. Um, we have a fuse file system based on top of pmemobj, so you, you, you can, uh, it's a, a user space file system, that, that, that's, that's kind of fun. Uh, one of the guys did a MySQL storage engine, um, a, a fairly naive one, because it's, it's, it's not designed, it's, it's not supposed to be fast, it's supposed to demonstrate how you can use these APIs in order to um, do interesting things, and this was one of the things he thought, hey, this would be interesting. And... Proving that I never learned my lesson, I'm going to try and do a demo. Okay. 
Oh, yeah. This is packaged as part of the uh, Git repository. So um, all of these objects are stored um, in, in persistent memory. In, so it's, it's all based on top of the PMOV API. So obviously, I'm going to lose that uh, level fairly soon. But you can also um, run it. You, 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 you almost only can't read this text. I'm sorry, this is the largest that my X term will do. If I'd been thinking properly, I'd have bugged Keith and got him to change the font or something. But um, this, this is it running. So th th this, that, that was PM, PM Invaders storing its objects on tempfs. This is PMMod storing its um, objects on the SSD that's in my laptop. And the SSD in my laptop, it's not the fastest one in the world. It does about 20,000 IOPS. So, yeah. Um, that doesn't go, look very good, does that? <clears throat> and uh, fortunately, you, be, be, because obviously this laptop doesn't have persistent memory in it, um, it, it it's using msync in order to synchronize those, um, uh, the, those, those objects to, to the disk. So if only somebody had created something that disabled msync. Oh, wait, they did. And we're back to running at full speed, um, just because we're not calling msync anymore, so everything is staying in memory. And um, it's called libby. It's called eat my data for a reason, because obviously, if uh, power goes out in the middle of this, we're we're, we're going to le we're going to lose our high score, and we really can't be having with that. So that was my demo, and that worked. My God. <laughs> And then I should have pressed Shift F5 instead of F5. So, so here, here, here are the uh, here, here are some things for you to look at. Um, PMO.io is where you can find the blog. You you can find an introduction to using NVML. You can find all kinds of good examples. Um, it's um, it, it's 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 a really useful um, resource. And of course, links to the source can be found. The source is stored on GitHub, but you can get links to it from PMO.io. Um, Obviously, it's fairly easy to find. And it's, it's sort of the whole point of it. Um, the YouTube video there, 45 minutes in, um, you, you'll, you'll see Diane Bryant talking about the uh, 3D Crosspoint uh, servers we'll be selling um, next year. And uh, the, the link at the bottom is um, more, um, mostly marketing material, if I'm honest, about 3D Crosspoint. Um, I think we'll be seeing, as, as, as these things get closer to release, we'll be seeing more uh, technical uh, data appearing, but uh, for, for now it's, um, it's, it's mostly marketing material. Some, some of it's informative and, and some of it's kind of, um, yeah, you know, it's all right. Um, so I would like to invite questions. Um, if, 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 it, if it's quick, shout it out and I'll repeat it. And if it's a more involved question, um, please wait for the microphone to be brought to you. I see no hands. I can't. I, oh, Andy. So the, it's going to be shipping, and you have this in your system in addition to a disk and memory. This would be another component, or re replace the existing component. Okay. The question is, um, you, we're, we're going to be shipping these things in 2017. Will, will we still have memory as well as persistent? Will we still have non-persistent memory as well as regular memory? Will we still have disks? Will we still have everything else? Yes. Um, we, we, we are not discontinuing support for DRAM just because we have this. Um, there, there, there are um, workloads which will prefer, and there are customers who will prefer to continue using DRAM uh, for various different reasons. Um, we, it, it really is a, a, a new layer in the storage hierarchy. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there are customers who will um, choose to not use SSDs because they because their entire workload will fit into the in, into persistent memory, um, but there's still very much a role for SSDs because you can put uh, there there are a limited number of DIM slots in your system, and you 
the the um, the replaceability, the serviceability story is not so great for. Uh, for, for DIMMs. And for some customers, that's an absolute deal killer. They absolutely need um, an SSD style. I can just pull the drive out, plug a new drive in. Other customers uh, say, well, you know, it's all in a data center. Everything falls over. So we, we, we treat a machine as our field replace, an entire machine as our field replaceable unit. And so we really don't care about the serviceability story at all. So um, again, we're, we're, we're not. It, you, you will have the choice about what components you want to put in your machine. We're not, uh, we're not, we're not discontinuing support for anything. Yes, sir. Um, so oh, there's a microphone coming to you. So, this, so the RAM will have comparable performance to current RAM, but um, persistent, or less or more, or, or will it have less? So... Um, with, with, with DIMMs you can buy today, performance is absolutely comparable to DRAM because a lot of them are DRAM. They're simply um, DRAM that will fall back onto uh, NAND on power loss. Um, the, I, I don't think I can talk... Well, I, I can tell you some things about the performance of uh, 3D Crosspoint. Um, you know, it, it, it is speeds that are comparable to DRAM. It is bandwidth comparable to DRAM. Um, it has significantly better endurance, which um, for the purpose of this talk I'm defining as a uh, number of writes before a bit goes bad. Um, it is significantly better endurance than NAND, but it is not as good as DRAM. So we, 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 we do guarantee that, um, you know, we, we will be guaranteeing that these DIMMs won't go bad within their warranty period. But we make absolutely no warranties about what's going to happen the day after the warranty expires. <laughs> um, by the way, a lot of people don't realize um, DRAM also has um, a, a problem with uh, writes actually uh, hit, um, wearing them out. Um, it's fairly hard to hit that, but um, it, I, I have actually seen it happen um, on, on machines that are under extremely heavy load. Um, when I was with a for former employer. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and any component in the system will wear out if you hit it hard enough for long enough. Um, and uh, the, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the reasons you're going to choose to want to still use DIMMs for some things over persistent memory. But the, the CPU goes back, do, does not respond well if uh, writes take too long to be serviced or, or, or reads take too long to come back. There's, there's some fairly tight timings on, on, the, uh, on the bus, which is something that's bitten some of the people who are making um, some of the cached uh, uh, DIMMs that are on the market today. I just have, I just have a question uh, about data remnants and how persistent memory will affect crypto libraries in terms of securing private keys and if libvmm uh, has considered this and is going to provide anything to defend against that. Yeah, okay, so Obvious, uh, this is the thing. It, I mean, it, it is something that our um, security people take very seriously. Um, there are some governments in the world who prohibit uh, cryptography being used in such a way as to prevent um, their security agencies or their police agencies from looking at uh, DIMMs. Or, or storage. Um, so if you were to buy a DIM in those jurisdictions, there would be no uh, cryptography support on that DIM. Um, in uh, more enlightened uh, jurisdictions, um, the, um, you, you, the, 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 there is crypto built in. You, you, in for, for, for DIMMs with crypto enabled, you will not be able to uh, use an electron microscope to find out things that were written to it. Um, you might still prefer 
to use uh, um, DIMMs uh, for security sensitive information. Um, I mean, it, it's going, it, it, does, it does depend on exactly which, who, whose DIMMs are we talking about and what purpose are they being sold for. So, um, you know, are, are we going to see CPUs uh, doing encryption and, uh, before the uh, cache line leaves the CPU, maybe? I don't, I don't, I don't it, 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 the, the, crypt, the cryptography we're talking about here is um, transparent to software. I mean, it has to be, right? Um, we, 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 we can't force stuff, the software can't encrypt before the cache line gets written. That starts to get really weird and hard. Um, so, you know, it's, it's got to be a hardware solution. And exactly what hardware solutions get implemented isn't, um, isn't something that you or I can affect. So that answer your question? Okay. Uh, you mentioned before about failure. Um, when one of these dims fail, and so we're turning the machine off, and it gets replaced, uh, what, whose problem is it? Is this an application problem now? Is this a, the kernel's problem? Is operating system problem? Because now we have effectively a bank of uh, six terabytes of memory that no longer exists. So. Uh, any thoughts on how that's going to be dealt with, handled, etc.? Yes. Um, there, there, there are people who have put a lot of thought into that, and I'm just trying to quickly remember exactly what the, uh, the story is there. Um, so you, you, don't necessarily, you, you, you wouldn't lose all six terabytes all at once. Um, so, yeah, you, we, you, you take a dim away and some some fraction, I mean, let, let, let's pretend there are, let's just keep it simple, let's pretend there are, are six DIMM slots in the system, each with a terabyte of memory in them. I, I don't think that's going to be true, but let's pretend for the sake of this. Um, so you would lose one terabyte. Now, how would, you, how would software see that missing terabyte, or, or that terabyte that's been replaced with, with, with a fresh DIMM? Um, it depends how you configured it, because you, with, with um, uh, with, with memory, you can choose how to set up interleaving. So you might set up two DIMMs interleaved, or you might set up three DIMMs interleaved, or you might set up all six DIMMs interleaved. And if you've done that, then you might see like every sixth cache line has gone, in which case you've basically said, OK, bye-bye data. I chose to run in the high-performance, high-risk mode rather than the mode in which we can perform some kind of redundancy. Like I said, we have, a, we have that replication feature in the library. Um, if you have the replication, if, if, if you choose to, let's say, do three-way interleave, um, so you have two sets of three, so you'd see um, the first three terabytes um, organized in, in, in sets of three, and then the second three terabytes. Um, you, you, you would, or you, you could, um, see two block devices, one for the first three terabytes and one for the second three terabytes. And then you could create the same, you could create the same file in each of them, mirror between the two. And that would give you resilience against that kind of uh, the, 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 the single DIM failure problem. Hello. Hello, Stuart. Hello. Um, I was thinking about as a problem that is sort of really several layers above, but uh, people thinking of it is, we're used to with disks uh, writing file formats through the Endian independent, or you do appropriate byte swapping, or we use something nice like XML that is, you know, rather text independent. Now with moving to persistent memory for a bunch of persistent storage, are we just now tying ourselves to specific compiler versions and structure packing uh, in an even more uh, subtle and easy to weigh mistake ways, and then you know exact uh, sizes of data types and specific languages so that it's harder to actually move from any one computer to another one or harder for us to make architectural changes? Yeah, it's, it's definitely something that people need to be concerned about. I mean, I, I think as programmers we have, uh, these days, we have a fairly um, advanced understanding of, okay, we need to serialize this stuff from its in-memory data format to its on-storage data format, and what on earth do we do when the two things are the same thing? Do, do we just store things in the storage format, even though it, it's, it's maybe less efficient to access because it's, it's no longer in architecture independent? Um, um, uh, format. Um, 
Yeah, definitely compiler versioning. You know, you, you upgrade your compiler and, and your language layout changes. As, uh, yeah, your data structure layouts change. That, 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 that's kind of bad. Um, so yeah, some, some care is definitely going to be needed. Um, as far as endianness goes, I don't think that's such a huge problem. I don't think there are a lot of customers who say, I'm going to take the six NVDIMs out of my Xeon system and I'm going to plug them into my big Endian power system. I don't think there's a lot of customer demand for that. We, we haven't seen any anyway. Um, the, for for buy Endian systems, do, do customers really boot them little Endian on Wednesdays and Thursdays and big Endian from Friday to Tuesday? I, I, I don't know. I, again, I, perhaps it is, yes. yes. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question, but um, I mean, I think all we can do is provide facilities to help programmers make the right decision easily and make it hard for them to make the wrong decision. And maybe we could come up with some kind of lint, some kind of tool that you could run over your source base that says, this is going to be a problem if you ever upgrade your compiler. Um, and maybe you want to think about changing your data structure right now before it goes into production. Um, I, I, I think there's some, there's some interesting, um, there, there are interesting and practical things for academics to work on that aren't going off and writing their own file system. And I would love it if more academics were approaching these kinds of problems. And some of them are. Some, some, some of them are actually very practical people and, and want to write software uh, that's going to get used by a lot of people. But um, I do see an awful lot of academics whose focus is very much on their academic career. You know, they need to get their paper published. And so they write software that will never get used um, and doesn't necessarily contribute. And, and because it's written in a particular way, it's just never going to be, uh, it's, it's not even going to provide useful examples or counterexamples of the way to do something. Um, and I think that's a real shame, but that isn't a problem that I can really help address. Are well, we? I'm sorry, uh, that's all we have time for. Perhaps uh, there are two questions I think I can see. Perhaps you can catch up with Matthew after the event or Perhaps email. Are you on the chat list? Uh, I am on the chat list, but um, I'm, I'm quite happy to uh, hang around after this talk for, for a few minutes and take questions. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you.